In this video, you will examine several important concepts behind semiconductor memory devices. You will learn about the basic technologies used, memory organization and configuration, as well as design considerations. Semiconductor memory devices may be classified in one or two basic categories, permanent or temporary. As you will see, both have similar properties, yet each plays a different role and each has unique advantages and disadvantages. You will examine both permanent and temporary memory devices in this video. We will begin by examining permanent devices first. As the name might suggest, permanent memory devices are capable of retaining information at all times, even if power is removed from the system. Permanent memory is said to be non-volatile and is used to store fixed program instructions which will not change during the life of the product. As you can see, there are four basic types of permanent memory devices. They are ROM, which stands for read-only memory, PROM, which stands for programmable read-only memory, EEPROM, which is erasable programmable read-only memory, and the EEPROM, which is electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. We will examine these devices one at a time. Let's begin with the ROM, or read-only memory, since it's the oldest and most straightforward of the permanent semiconductor memory devices. The data contained within a read-only memory device is usually specified by the customer. The IC is then manufactured to contain this data. Once it has been manufactured, it can never be altered. In order to change the information contained within the ROM device, a new IC must be manufactured, then substituted for the old one. Since this is a time-consuming and expensive process, the read-only memory device is economically feasible only when used in large volumes for a thoroughly debugged application. To understand how the read-only memory device works, we will examine this simple circuit diagram of a 16-bit ROM which uses diode elements. At first glance, this circuit may look somewhat complicated, but in reality, its operation is very simple. You should have noticed there are two decoder circuits used in this ROM device. One is used for the columns and one is used for the rows. The control circuitry used for the ROM devices is designed to read one row at a time and one column at a time for each row. We will now examine the operation of this simple circuit. When row 00 and column 00 is scanned, the current will flow through from ground through resistor R1, through transistor Q1, through diode D1, through resistor R2, then to B+. The value of resistor R2 will be much greater than resistor R1, therefore the majority of the voltage drop will be placed across resistor R2. This places the bottom of R2 close to ground potential, therefore a low is being produced at the output. Next, row 00, column 01 is scanned. Since column 01 has a diode connecting the column decoder to transistor Q1's collector, the current now has two paths with which to flow. Since the forward resistance of the selected diode is much less than that of diode D1 and resistor R2, most of the current will flow through the selected diode. This results in less current flowing through resistor R2, which in turn causes the voltage drop across R2 to decrease. This in effect causes the output to become closer to the B plus potential, which results in a high at the output. This sequence will continue throughout the entire ROM device. First a row is selected, then the columns are selected one at a time. Every time a diode is placed between the row device and the column decoder, the current will flow through the selected diode, causing the output to go high. In the same respect, when there is no diode connecting the row to the column, then the current will flow through resistor R2, which will result in the bottom of R2 being brought closer to the ground potential, thus producing a low at the output. Even though this simple circuit has only one output, its basic operating principle remains the same regardless of the number of outputs. Read-only memory devices are available in both TTL and MOS configurations.
Here you see a block diagram of a 4096-bit read-only memory device which is organized in a 512 word by 8-bit memory configuration. Notice that it contains the row and column decoder sections, an address input buffer, an output driver stage, and a 512 word by 8-bit memory section. The output of the device is enabled by applying a logic high to the chip enable input. Some manufacturers refer to the chip enable input as the chip select or the output enable input. To read the information contained at a particular location in the ROM device, the 10-bit pattern address must be placed into the address input buffer section. Then the chip enable input is brought high which causes the data stored at the specified address to be output via the IC's output pins which are labeled D0 through D7. The data then travels along the data bus to the microprocessor. Typical access time for such read operations is approximately 15 to 80 nanoseconds for most TTL ROM devices. When the chip enable input returns to its low state, the outputs become disabled and the output line returns to a high impedance state which effectively disconnects the ROM device from the data bus. We will now pause for a brief review of the material just discussed. The data contained within the read-only memory device must be constructed within the device by the manufacturer. Once the ROM is fabricated, the information contained within the device cannot be altered. In order to change the data, a new device must be manufactured. The typical access time for a read operation of a TTL ROM device is approximately 15 to 80 nanoseconds. There are two basic types of memory devices, permanent and temporary. The ROM is a permanent type memory storage device. Read-only memory devices are commonly available in both TTL and MOS configurations. The chip enable input is oftentimes referred to as a chip select or output enable input. To read information from a ROM device, the address must be selected and the enable input must be activated. This concludes review number one. Next we will examine the PROM device. This sequence will continue throughout the entire ROM device. First a row is selected, then the columns are selected one at a time. Every time a diode is placed between the row device and the column decoder, the current will flow through the selected diode, causing the output to go high. In the same respect, when there is no diode connecting the row to the column, then the current will flow through resistor R2, which will result in the bottom of R2 being brought closer to the ground potential, thus producing a low at the output. Even though this simple circuit has only one output, its basic operating principle remains the same regardless of the number of outputs. Read-only memory devices are available in both TTL and MOS configurations. Here you see a block diagram of a 4096-bit read-only memory device which is organized in a 512 word by 8-bit memory configuration. Notice that it contains the row and column decoder sections an address input buffer, an output driver stage, and a 512 word by 8-bit memory section. The output of the device is enabled by applying a logic high to the chip enable input. Some manufacturers refer to the chip enable input as the chip select or the output enable input. To read the information contained at a particular location in the ROM device, the 10-bit pattern address must be placed into the address input buffer section. Then the chip enable input is brought high, 
which causes the data stored at the specified address to be output via the IC's output pins, which are labeled D0 through D7. The data then travels along the data bus to the microprocessor. Typical access time for such read operations is approximately 15 to 80 nanoseconds for most TTL ROM devices. When the chip enable input returns to its low state, the outputs become disabled and the output line returns to a high impedance state which effectively disconnects the ROM device from the data bus. We will now pause for a brief review of the material just discussed. The data contained within the read-only memory device must be constructed within the device by the manufacturer. Once the ROM is fabricated, the information contained within the device cannot be altered. In order to change the data, a new device must be manufactured. The typical access time for a read operation of a TTL ROM device is approximately 15 to 80 nanoseconds. There are two basic types of memory devices, permanent and temporary. The ROM is a permanent type memory storage device. Read-only memory devices are commonly available in both TTL and MOS configurations. The chip enable input is oftentimes referred to as a chip select or output enable input. To read information from a ROM device, the address must be selected and the enable input must be activated. This concludes review number one. Next we will examine the PROM device.